very much. It's really great to be back here, actually, and seeing so many um, old friends and, and familiar faces. Um, in this paper, um, I'm going to look at the way that the Merseyside archaeological history has evolved in a rather different way, and, and in what I hope will add a kind of fresh dimension to a biography of its life and its achievements as a local archaeological group over the last 40 years. And in this, I feel very much I'm kind of continuing the work of others here in, in, in Merseyside. And particularly, I want to acknowledge Peter Davey and the fact that, you know, such a shame he couldn't be here today. And I actually modified my title slightly from the original to Making Merseyside Heritage after some reflection on how it would be most useful to look at this kind of biography of the society. Now, as a society in general... We, we make, we construct heritage, we construct interpretive histories out of the material of the past and our experiences of it. So it's uh, both the material and what we bring to it ourselves. And, and we can refer to the work of academics, I'm sure you know these, like Laura Jane Smith and Emma Waterton and their critiques of archaeological heritage as constructed by orthodoxies of practice. But what I want to think about in making heritage uh, in Merseyside is in relation to the societies in a number of quite specific ways. Firstly, there's a sense in which the work of this group, the MAS, has made in a material way, um, contributed to the understanding of Merseyside's archaeological heritage through its work in creating new knowledge. And we heard quite a lot about that from Rob. There are archaeological sites that we now know about and understand because of field work by the society. And there's material out there on the galleries um, from excavations and field projects um, that the society has run. So there's real substance, material substance, in the work uh, that the group has done. So that's one kind of heritage. Then secondly, there's the MAS's role in stewardship of Merseyside's heritage. There are sites and there are institutions that the MAS has campaigned to protect and sustain over the years, um, which, we would, which we would not have otherwise. Uh, the Calderstones... It's work in setting up the Archaeological Survey of Merseyside. And then thirdly, and this is what I really want to focus on, is the MAS's own heritage as a social network of shared interests and enthusiasms and of expertises and um, of activism. And after 40 years, it has its own heritage as an institution. And it began and it remains a place where networks of interests intersect, museum, volunteer projects, local heritage trusts, community projects, university researchers, students, detectorists, local historians. It's all meshed together. So there is thirdly Merseyside Archaeological Society's own heritage as this kind of social network and actor. And it's that that I really want to focus in on. Because there's been a kind of... Um, Darwinian evolution of these roles for the society over the years as it's adapted to respond to changing circumstances. Um, it's grown its membership and its activities since 1976 in a really challenging landscape of shifting resources and changing archaeological politics. It's seen, as Rob um, has already alluded to, it's seen the rise of commercially funded professional archaeology, the establishment and the growth of, and the decline, one, some might argue, of public heritage services, and it's moved forward into the current ethos of community-centred archaeological stewardship. Now, much is talked about the sustainability of community heritage groups and their impacts and outcomes for local communities and places, and we're, we're going to be hearing more about that later in this conference. And looking over four decades of heritage practice in, this local, in local archaeology with this group, it provides the kind of longitudinal study over time that's very rarely available um, in archaeology, in community archaeology, certainly. And it's quite unique in terms of the focus that it provides for research. And so that's what I and my colleague David Jennings, um, who may still be interviewing people, yes, he is, <laughs> uh, are quite interested in, in working with, really, this rich resource of experience um, that arises out of 40 years of working in local archaeology. Now, there have been quite a lot of retrospective assessments of the society before, and you've had a couple this morning, so I'm going to try and skip over the bits that are repetitive. But I think one of the nice things about the way the society has grown is that it's tended to be quite reflective about its achievements at key points. And this conference is one in a succession 
of conferences that have taken place um, with the, the society looking around to reposition itself and take stock of what it's achieved with its partners. We had Ian Longworth reflecting on the first decade in the 10th anniversary volume. Then there was Peter's kind of seminal review, Peter Davies' seminal review of the first 25 years in 2001. And then most recently, uh, the joint paper that Sam Rowe and Liz Stewart and Dave Roberts did, reflecting on the society's achievements with the NML uh, and on Rainford's roots in particular. So today's papers, I think, are very much in a tradition of looking back over the society's field work and, and um, reassessing its direction of travel. In this paper, what I want to do is take a rather different approach and to use just the archive and publications of the society as the primary source for making a narrative of the MAS's history, its heritage, in its own words. And they'll be your words, actually, some of you, because you will have written them. Um, so the words of its members and its officers from its minutes and its reports and its publications. And I want to thank the museum very much for giving us access to that uh, uh, archive and indeed to individuals who, who let us see personal collections of papers um, for which David and I are very grateful. My observations today are based on a very rapid scanning of what is a very considerable archive that David is going to be working on over the next three years, four years. Um, so this is very much a sort of snapshot. Um, and I also want to emphasise the fact that though for me I was actually present in, in some of this um, for a bit, a bit at the beginning and a, and a little bit, very little bit, uh, a few years ago. I've kind of blanked out my, my experience and I've tried to use just those archives to interpret a story of the way the society set itself up and has developed. So, 1974, Merseyside, New Metropolitan Authority. I have no slides, by the way. I left them all with the archaeological survey when I, when I left. So I have no slides. It's just, it's just my words and your words, actually, that I'm going to quote. So Merseyside was a new authority in 74, embracing a new identity, as Rob has said, bringing together two administratively quite separate areas of Lancashire and Cheshire, arguably very much neglected by 20th century archaeological research, um, overlain by a, an interesting and, and, in its own right, very um, significant uh, urban layer from the 18th and 19th century. So from 1974, Merseyside did in need, indeed need to make its own heritage as a, a new metropolitan area. The last ex major excavation had been in 1927, apparently. Uh, there's no archaeological journal, journal uh, no active university research in the county, a very active university archaeology department, but working largely in other parts of the country and, and the world. And at the time, no existing museum interest in local archaeological research. So this was, in some ways, a nearly blank canvas, but there was this very keen interest amongst local people through WA classes, the university's extramural department, student archaeological societies at the university and at Christ's College, uh, and a real awareness that the new county's heritage was being eroded and no focus for bringing people together. So in March 76, a group of those who'd been active in some of those early Merseyside archaeological forays to record threatened sites, and some of you who are here who were amongst that number, I'm sure, um, formed themselves into a steering group to take forward this idea of a, a society for Merseyside. Uh, and that was formally founded, I believe, on the 4th of December 1976, so we haven't quite got to the 40th anniversary point yet. So that's just background, and from this point on, I'm going to be looking at MAS's history on its own account, uh, the way it organised itself and evolved through looking at its records of what, and what it's done. And then periodically... Um, what I want to do is step back from that, and I might just sort of move to indicate where I'm doing that, um, think about the bigger context in which all of this was happening. So, you know, what's the political, environmental, economic uh, background to all of that? So thinking first of all then about its overall aims, in 1976, I think we briefly saw a slide of that actually from, from Rob, um, in 1976, the society's new aims were what, one you, what you might have expected, really, um, publishing, arranging lectures, visits, conferences, encouraging um, the promotion of archaeological research. 
but several of its envisaged functions were interesting and perhaps a bit different. One was that it said it was going to be prepared to organise archaeological resources in the county for field work and excavation, and that it was going to collect information for a central record system. And then last, and only added finally in the consultation meeting in, in December uh, of the year, to interest public, to, sorry, to encourage public interest in and concern for archaeology. Um, so that idea of public engagement very much coming to the fore already. So seemingly at that point in 1976, the MAS clearly, in the absence of any other structures or institutions to lead archaeology, saw itself as being not only a facilitator of uh, archaeological work, but an agency for managing Merseyside's archaeological resources. Now, those, those rules, those first kind of um, objectives of the society, got rewritten conveniently uh, 25 years later, uh, which is a very useful horizon for us looking at you know, how things have moved on. Uh, and it's quite, this was when it became a charitable institution, so the rules were re rewritten. And it's interesting that while most of the central objects remain exactly the same, um, the two about organising resources for the county and gathering data for an SMR have been taken out. Another thing that I noticed had changed in ploughing my way through, you know, year after year of these minutes and, and, and um, newsletters, is the way in which the society, another way in which the society's governance changed over the years, which was in the roles of its council members. Originally, there were the usual roles of chair and vice chair and, and officers. But in addition, there was to be a member of council for each component district of Merseyside. Uh, and they were responsible for arranging at least one lecture or meeting from the programme in that district every year. Uh, and I think we, you know, we could, um, to promote the society within the, within the district, and I think we can see that as part of their need in the early years to try and get some sort of cohesive identity for Merseyside as a region. Um, but by 2001, that arrangement had been discontinued and of, uh, it, in fact, had been disbanded in 1994. So there was a bit of a struggle to find representatives for some districts. So that, that original structure uh, was no longer in place, and perhaps the need for it had gone. So looking at that first 25 years of the young MAS, it's quite interesting to see how it saw, its, how it saw itself. Margaret Warhurst, the late Margaret Warhurst, a real champion of the society's work, explained that the MAS was formed in a, at a time when there was no person or organisation to promote archaeological activity or to provide an obvious focus for archaeological interest. The society was instrumental in the establishment of the Archaeological Survey of Merseyside and the Liverpool University Rescue Archaeology Unit. And they were set up in 1977 and 1979 as short-term appointments funded through the Department of the Environment. Five years later, in 1983, the Society's newsletter is reporting that permanent posts have been secured for the field and survey archaeologists in the museum. Um, the latest MSC scheme, remember the MSC schemes, um, will finish at the end of March, but it also reports that uh, the Northwest Archaeological Trust is being established in Liverpool to ensure the continuity of professional rescue archaeology in Merseyside and its environs, because the DOE cannot be relied upon to sustain funding, that sounds quite uh, familiar, uh, for rescue archaeology. And so the society already is, well, we're only sort of seven years on, is already supporting the formation of a new trust for uh, archaeology in the northwest to take the place of the archaeological unit, which is already being closed down. So clearly it has a very uh, strong view, the society, in its early years that it's fostering a professional archaeological service. It, it convenes, and I was quite struck by this when David drew my attention to it, it actually convened and minuted all the monthly progress meetings for the archaeological survey um, with the county museums and the planning department and, and the university. Uh, so it, it acted as a kind of umbrella body, really, bringing all of those groups together. Uh, but things were not to continue in such a straightforward way for long, and as Rob has said, it was quite a complicated arrangement. So by 1981, the newsletter's noting that a new quango is going to take over responsibility for ancient monuments and archaeology from the DOE. That would be English heritage, as we now know it. 
Uh, but um, the society made representations to the CBA about this because they, they suspected that a more commercial attitude to the maintenance and management of historic buildings would be likely to be the result of this. And indeed, government policy for funding archaeology was handed over from the DOE to the new English heritage, uh, which continued with alacrity under Jeff Wainwright's guiding hand to shift core funding of units to project and developer funding in the mid-1980s. And like many other units, the, the one here closed. So the society continues to play a key role in trying to find a solution to how you get these professional services and advice in place. And it identifies the um, abolition of the metropolitan counties as a, real, a really serious risk to its future. This is in 1986. It's only been in existence for 12 years. Uh, and the society notes in its newsletter very clearly that there's no financial provision for archaeology. It's plain to see that the SMR, so painstakingly established, uh, could be completely eliminated. Um, and so they... Um, in the newsletter, ask, asking members to play a part in, in protecting the, the future of Merseyside by publicising the risk of the loss of this funding. So as well as the newsletters for this period, the AGM minutes provide quite an interesting narrative for seeing how the society's role shifted. Who would have thought that AGM minutes could be interesting? Well, if you look at them over 25 years, really, really some, some, some interesting patterns. Um, the, the first AGMs were held in the Royal Institution in the city centre until 1981, then various venues in the museum for the next 18 years, so really stable period, during which Merseyside County Museums became National Museums Liverpool. And then from 1999, the museum was no longer able to host the meetings, uh, and the society moves to meet in the Department of Continuing Education in the university. So if we look at the minutes at the turn of the millennium, the 25-year horizon, um, it's quite interesting to see how things are shifting about. Um, they've just published, the Society's just published volume 11, bringing together all of this really valuable professional work. Uh, and of course, there's a lot of crossover between professionally engaged and voluntary engaged actors in this first, first uh, 25 years. The Society's first steering committee in 1976 had a fairly even mix of people from different professional institutes and voluntary sector, about 50-50, I would say. By 2001, 25 years on, that membership has evidently moved away from that significant professional involvement, and it's paying tribute to the retirement of its editor, Philippa Tomlinson, who left only one representative amongst the Society's council, from the heritage professionals. And the minutes of that meeting, that council meeting, are quite interesting. Um, they're noting, people are noting the need to try and find representatives from the university and the museum. There's no report from the university or the museum for that meeting. And, and one gets a sense of it be becoming a little bit disconnected. Um, all the Heritage Open Day activities are focused on Norton Priory. Um, and this is also the point, as I mentioned, where the society stops meeting in the museum. And this is, I think, because the museum's being rebuilt, probably. I, I would imagine that's the reason. Um, about 2001, 2002. Um, and seemingly things are a little dislocated. There's a rather plaintive note in the minutes that the MAS filing cabinet located in the university has gone missing, presumably with all of the archives as well. But there'll be more about that later. Uh, so there are people here for whom that period is a lived experience, I know. And, and you and, and you will have perhaps a totally different um, perception of how that felt being at that period. But, but if we step back and look at what was happening in national heritage policy and practice then, we can see that this is the culmination of that decade following PPG 16, when developer-funded archaeology gets embedded in the planning system. The Heritage Lottery Fund has only just got going. Uh, new Labour Sustainable Communities policies haven't started yet. Uh, and we're kind of a few years away from capturing the public value of heritage sort of rhetoric and, and thinking, which marks a real watershed, I, I think, in, in heritage as a shared public resource and, and a community-centred uh, activity. So that shift towards localism and coalition government is still some years away. Um, coalition government, big society agenda, I mean. So 
it, it, it's not at all surprising then at that sort of 70, sorry, 25 year horizon that there's some kind of loss of momentum. But surprisingly, even though it is a fairly low ebb in the voluntary sector's um, support, the society's minutes still sound quite resilient, really. New website, pretty good for 2001, commenting on the Valletta Convention, contributing to initial meetings for a regional research strategy, uh, making a contribution to the all-party parliamentary group, and two CBA consultations. And of course, that 25th anniversary conference in 2001 and then the follow-up in 2003 uh, were a real testimony to the work that had been started and sustained over a generation. Um, and Peter Davy wrote that at that point, the role of the society remains crucial. It, it's the only body that has the initiation and publication of archaeological research in the county as its prime functions. And Margaret Woolhurst, in her review of that conference foresees a major role for it in the future, both directly and acting as a catalyst. Um, and Margaret quotes Rob, actually, in saying that the society's achievement has been in peopling the landscape of Merseyside. And that phrase arguably has a double meaning, actually, and not just giving archaeology in Merseyside a new people's past, but also building the capacity of its archaeological communities to people that landscape. So peopling the landscape of Merseyside, Rob, that's a great legacy to have left. So the MAS enters the new millennium in good heart, but occupying shifting ground and new territory. Uh, the AGMs move from the university to the Pilgrim Bar and Bistro for a few years, um, with a free glass of wine, apparently. And then they go back to the university using one of the lecture theatres, and then latterly to the Quaker Meeting House as kind of independent meeting place. So interesting to see how its kind of centre of gravity shifts. And continuing to work alongside the museum and the university, the, the minutes of the society suggest that it's entering a phase that's in some ways more close to its activism in the 1970s. Um, the 2003 AGM notes training excavations and then training in field walking, uh, training in churchyard surveys another year later, a new generation of members presumably coming along and, and new capacity building. And it also, of course, alludes to the new Museum of Liverpool concept being investigated uh, and the idea of having a museum with a focus on local archaeological um, uh, information and, 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 uh, and stories. So the society is successful and um, proactive in this period, producing the change of face of, changing face of Liverpool, the new Calderstones project, the Capital of Culture project. And at this point, the lost filing cabinet also crops up again and is evidently relocated to plastic boxes in Dave Roberts' attic, where they probably still are. <laughs> ah. So, holding on to its paper heritage, really important. Uh, and of course, the MAS is very uh, involved and proactive in meetings about the way that the mu new museum would develop. And it's at this point, about 2006, 2007, that we see community start appearing in the minutes, community digs, community archaeology workshops, attending a national conference on community archaeology, looking forward to the opening of the museum and new possibilities for the future. Then, 2011, the loss of the Merseyside Archaeological Advisory Service becomes a really urgent issue. Um, the society noting that the funding has been withdrawn from April 2001, no archaeological advice on development, the HER basically being mothballed. And it starts to plan actions to protest about the consequences of this with local councillors and officials. And it, it would be interesting to know what other people's impressions are of this particular period, actually, in, in um, 2011, because it looks from the records very much like MAS really starting to raise its game. Um, a new look newsletter uh, starts in the autumn of 2011, a new website which makes all of this stuff available digitally, the newsletters and, and, and other material, and then a Facebook page in 2012. So suddenly it's much more outward facing. And my re-involvement just briefly was in 2012 when the CBA convened a meeting here to discuss what action we could take together to um, try to restore the archaeological advisory service. And um, 
in the newsletter following that meeting, there's some very firm commitments. We intend to keep the pressure on until a satisfactory solution can be found. And uh, ad uh, urging members to continue to be vigilant in looking at planning applications to ensure that sites weren't being lost in the meantime. So the lobbying continued. A long round of correspondence with the City Council and Chief Executive um, and, and with other local authorities. And of course, the wider national context for all of this, 2011-12, is the economic recession and the austerity measures, which meant that cultural and heritage services were very vulnerable, and particularly in one like Merseyside, which was funded by a relatively fragile alliance of local authorities, so it was particularly vulnerable. And also, following the coalition government election in 2010, planning policy and public policy generally moving towards a much more deregulated environment. PPPS 5, um, which we'd only just got used to, wonderful document, was replaced by the National Planning Policy Framework. Uh, and this was used by the City Council as a rather doubtful justification for claiming they no longer needed to meet their obligations under the new legislation. But the MAS was great. It was on their back all the time. And I know it was only one among several voices, but it really is some of the, the, the words that were coming out are very um, powerful and, and quite passionate and I'm sure made a difference. The HER should not be a living record, should, sorry, should be a living record, not a static one. Uh, the fact that it's not currently accessible means that it's not only unavailable for consultation, but nothing new is being added. This is a scandalous state of affairs and as archaeologists, amateur and professional, we should be doing something about this. So those newsletters from um, the from 2011 onwards, which I was looking at only yesterday, with their new illustrated format, um, give a real sense of the society coming into its own again, campaigning about the advisory service, working with the council to improve the condition of the cobblestones, um, and importantly, developing an HLF bid for the Rainford Roots Community Archaeology Project with the museum. So by 2013, cautious optimism, uh, and by the, the AGM in the following year, the chair is able to report significant progress after two and a half years of uncertainty in one of the most intractable issues that has ever faced the society. Uh, and by that point, the five district councils had reached agreement about co-funding an HER, which Ben now runs, and appointing a, a full-time HER officer and development control officer. So, like all historical narratives, even for a relatively recent period, this is an interpretation. It's my interpretation of just looking at those archives. And it might be possible to step back, you know, over, over a longer period of time and a greater distance, and see the emergence of the society from this period as a stronger and more resourceful and resilient body with its successful Rainford Roots partnership uh, and the strengthened relationship between the university, the society and the museum. Is this part of the next evolutionary cycle for the MAS? Is it moving into a more proactive period of partnership and community-based activity? Well, the, um, how am I doing for time? Okay, yeah. The Autumn Newsletter last year on the website, have a look, invites MAS members to take part in working uh, in compiling data for the HER, which it set out to create in 1976. Its finances in good heart with income from publication sales, which has always been a really important part of its economy. Encouraging members to get involved in monitoring industrial heritage sites at risk. There's a fantastic informative newsletter keeping people involved. Uh, and connected with other local projects, of which there are many more now. The Calderstones group, Reading Group, Poulton Research Project, Lister Library, Big Heritage, Greater Manchester Graffiti Project, local heritage projects. So that's bringing new people uh, into the frame as well. So where, where does it go next? What is the role for a local group like this in a continuing climate of cuts with shrinking public services for heritage and now Brexit? Well, I think that's what we're here to think about, partly, partly to reflect on what's been achieved, but also to think collectively about, you know, what, where do you go next? What would members like to see happen? The next contribution to this archive will be the record of this weekend's conference, which is being videoed, and it will include your contributions and ideas about the future 
and that continuing partnership between the museum, the archaeology service, the HER and the university. And, and the strength of that joint working through good times and not so good runs through the society's life story that comes through very strongly. And arguably that's one of the reasons for its longevity and its, its resilience. And it's a really solid platform for moving forward to its 50th anniversary, I hope, and huge opportunities for locally led and community centered projects in the future. So I just wanted to end, and this would have been on my slide, but it's still there, with a few words that in my reading came out really strongly out of that working my way through the society's own account of its role in shaping Merseyside's heritage. Catalyst, campaigner, collaborator, communicator, and community actor. And it would be nice to use those ideas, perhaps those themes, to structure some of our discussions later on in the weekend. Thank you very much.